My name is Steve Hollander. I'm a partner at Watson Farley, focusing on capital markets, private equity, and uh, general corporate matters. We, uh, you know, our panel today is on capital markets, which uh, in today's market is an interesting discussion. So without further ado, I'll briefly introduce each of the panel members and just jump right into questions. The, uh, I guess I'll, in, in the order uh, closest to me, uh, Krista Volpicelli, Managing Director of City, then Andrew Harrox, Managing Director, Global Head of Transportation at Credit Suisse. Then Jeff Prebor, Managing Director and Global Head of Maritime at Jefferies. Uh, next to him, Wiley Griffiths, Managing Director, Global Transportation at Morgan Stanley. And finally, last but not least, Eric Schles, Managing Director at Wells Fargo Securities. Uh, so we pretty much have a panel that hopefully everybody here knows, and if they don't, uh, you know, they are uh, pretty, much, pre pretty well known in the industry. and. Uh, clearly are very well uh, positioned to answer some questions on capital markets. Um, but let's start off with kind of the basics uh, for those, uh, just to kind of set the stage, which is what is the impression of the capital markets currently for shipping companies? Uh, obviously, it's uh, interesting times, uh, things that we haven't seen probably in the history of shipping, at least not in, uh, in our lifetimes or my lifetime. But uh, I guess we'll start, whoever, whoever wants to jump in or I'll just start picking on people. I'm happy to start. Um, and is your question from the perspective of the investors or the, from the perspective of the issuers? Well, I'll say dealer's choice. I was thinking investor, but, uh, okay. but feel free. Um, well, I, I guess what I would say at a high level, and, and we can generalize shipping, but as we all know, there's different sectors which are performing quite differently in terms of the underlying dynamics. Uh, but what I will say is there's been no new capital issuance in the U.S. in shipping since the first half of last year. Uh, much of that is due to the fact that we've seen a, a big deterioration in equity values, uh, as I talked about earlier. And so I would say that investors, uh, there, are, there are places where investors want to invest. Um, some of the companies are difficult to invest in, given their trading liquidity. And many issuers in today's environment are concerned about their cost of capital and raising dilutive equity. So, um, you know, there's a lot of things happening in the world that are going into that and, and volatility that we have to navigate through. Uh, but I think it is, it's a capital intensive sector, uh, uh, but it's a sector where it's a smaller base of investors who have stayed consistently in over time. And I think that we're, to some degree, going through a shift in who those investors are at this point in time, given the volatility in the markets. Hmm. Anyone else agree or disagree? No? Well, uh, Krista touched on one thing, which is it, 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 the difficulties we have now really stem from the broader difficulties uh, in the capital markets, I believe, not, not so much you know, to the various sectors of shipping. We, we all know that some of those sectors are having a tough time. But when you come to access to capital, you know, uh, to, to deliberately mangle the phrase, I think when the general capital markets sneeze, I think that the shipping capital markets, you know, get typhoid fever. Uh, so it, 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 what, what we're, we're, that's the problem we have now is that the last six months of last year was really, really bad, really scary for volatility in the, in the big market. And then the beginning of this year was even scarier than that. Uh, so we had this question of what, would there be a U.S. recession? Would China be able to transition from a, will China to be able to transition from an investment economy to a consumption economy without a hard landing in between? You know, when, when will commodities ever stop falling? Well, you know, uh, the, the slight ray, uh, ray of hope, a ray of light, is that some of those, some of those questions have gotten uh, a little less scary since the beginning of the year. So since maybe a few weeks ago, we think we're beginning to see some general improvement in the overall markets. And, Shipping won't lead its way out of that, but maybe shipping will follow the overall markets in, in recovering. Maybe I'll just follow up on that, as I think it's a good point. Uh, we tend to think of uh, stocks as trading. If you're an issuer, for the most part, you think of your stock trading on the basis of fundamentals of your business. We tend to look at it that way, but technicals are really important. And what happened uh, in the bear market that really took off and we really experienced in January and February, and we have some stabilization now, as Jeff said, is a, a unique phenomenon where stocks were falling at the same time that bond spreads were rising and commodities were falling. And so there was really no safe place. It was a true bear market and it's scary for an investor. There was really no place to go, uh, even 
putting your money in cash or in something akin to cash in a negative interest rate environment isn't a safe place to be. So that's a very scary proposition for investors. Um, and of course, I, I think that's right. I think uh, you know the shipping markets tend to overreact to the overall sentiment. Uh, the shipping capital markets tend to overreact to the overall sentiment in the capital markets. The other force at work, um, which maybe we'll come on to later, is the the high uh, correlation or overlap between energy investors and maritime investors. And so we had a, another phenomenon where many of those maritime investors, there's a heavy hedge fund component uh, of those investors, were facing redemptions and were forced sellers. Uh, so you had overall money coming out of the capital markets at the same time as this over this forced selling going on. And so even though this is why you could say, hey, well, my stock isn't, I, I don't trade with crude oil, why is my stock going down when crude oil is falling? And the, the answer to that, at least part of the answer to that, is the connection between the investors. Those investors had to take capital out of the market and therefore uh, stocks went down. So the good news is we seem to have found kind of a more of a stable point and there's actually been some rally uh, in the last few weeks um, that maybe we can draw some conclusions from. But that's kind of the phenomenon we've experienced certainly over the last few months. Sure, Eric. Uh, one, uh, another factor that I would add that that is uh, not unique to shipping but uh, is a characteristic of, of uh, shipping stocks in general is that in a lot of capitally intense businesses when when values of stocks of equities fall uh, people anticipate consolidation and I think that one of the one of the things that you tend not to see in shipping is the consolidation that you might expect otherwise for all the structural reasons that we know but I think that if we start to see some significant consolidation that's when people who think about investing in capitally intense businesses at a low point in the cycle because in anticipation of consolidation could be brought into the fold. Thanks. You, you mentioned, two, two things were mentioned that I, I want to touch upon. I guess we'll, uh, we'll take them in order in which they were brought up. The first is kind of something that Jeff mentioned, which is the global uh, macro, the, the global concept of how, uh, how factors outside of shipping affect the shipping industry. Um, you know, how, how much of the problem, you could put that, call it a problem, is this global macro? You know, China, consumption, uh, things that are commodity prices in general, things that are outside really the, the control uh, than the rather than the shipping markets themselves. And, you know, when does that get better? If that's even a question that can be answered. I'll, I'll take a stab. Um, so Jeff brought up the macro. I think the macro affects the whole market. So I think there's kind of a cascading effect. First off, shipping is considered a riskier part of your portfolio. So the macro for the broader equity market has to be good enough or constructive enough that um, there is a market. Then shipping has to be not too scary to c contemplate. And then investors have to go in, as, as Krista said, differentiate between the subsectors and do some fundamental analysis so that people start going long stocks and stocks appreciate certainly from where we are now. And then as it relates to shipping as, say, a derivative of some of the macro factors like oil or China, et cetera, investors have to be doing that fundamental analysis to be able to pick stocks and to say, I want this exposure because it has a tie into the macro. So it feels like it kind of has to heal on a more generic macro basis. And then you can get into, you know, am I going to be long, short oil? Do I feel like I have enough visibility on China, et cetera? Yeah, I, I just, I, I agree with what Wiley said. I think that, um, I would say that in many respects, you, you live by the sword and you die by the sword and that uh, shipping was, was, as stocks were really strong, was viewed as a play on China and a, and a play on the strong energy economy. I think that um, what needs to, and, and so that obviously concern about those elements creates concern about, 
about shipping stocks. I think that the shipping companies need to demonstrate that they are, fa are in fact decoupled from those trends and that, for example, the, uh, the, the fact that, that China is going through the economic transformation that Jeff alluded to may in fact be a reason that more iron ore is needed because domestic mines are going to get shut down. And I, so I think that, I think that when you are a derivative of, of a couple of industries and those industries are not performing well, you need to then really make it clear that there is potential, as, we heard, as we've heard in several of the panels today, outside of those for which the, the derivative was created. I would just add, if, if you take one subsector and you look at the maritime MLPs, if you look at last year and the price of oil, the trading valuations of the MLP sector as a whole was 80 to 90 percent correlated with the price of oil last year. Uh, shipping, there's 12 publicly listed MLPs, there's over 100 MLPs in the energy sector, so shipping was dragged along with it. So I think that's absolutely an example of the price of oil having an impact on current trading levels. Thanks. On that note, uh, that's the second time we've, uh, we've kind of touched upon MLPs once explicitly and now implicitly, or implicitly now explicitly. It, do you guys see a future for MLPs in the shipping space? I'll grab the mic. Um, yeah, first a quick answer is yes. Um, and I know there's some dislocation now and, and some noise around them, and certainly it's a popular subject to wonder, uh, hey, does this, do MLP still work for shipping companies? But the forces at work that uh, broadened, that essentially have been driving yield-oriented investing over the last, let's say, 10 years, uh, still exist today. Those are low interest rates, uh, an aging population, that w you know, institutionalization of the MLP investor base, where uh, that's much more sophisticated. Uh, then really if you looked at the MLP investor base 20 years ago, those forces are at least as strong today as they were two years ago. Um, it's, you know, we might, no one maybe believed it two years ago, but we might be still in the early stages of having low interest rates, at least globally. So, um, so the forces at work that have been driving investor interest in yield-oriented product generally are at least as strong today as they were before. That's the best argument for why, as an asset class, MLPs will continue to be strong and continue to have, they'll continue to be bid and more capital flowing into, uh, you know, into that market. I think the broader, the second dimension of the question is, is the applicability for shipping the same or at least as strong as it has been? And there, I, my suspicion is that the in investors are going to be more focused. I think in a bull market, uh, investors, MLP investors, tended to forgive, uh, be more forgiving about charter length, uh, about charter coverage, more forgiving about balance sheet strength, all the things that are sort of classically important uh, in an MLP and matter in an MLP. And, uh, so I, our belief at Credit Suisse is that the MLP market is, has, is fundamentally sound, will rally, that it's still appropriate for shipping companies, but we expect investors to be, as opposed to say the bull market in shipping MLPs a couple of years ago, more focused on features in a shipping MLP that are more classically oriented uh, with an MLP. Thank you. I'll, I'll throw so, one more comment in there. My, my, my team in uh, Houston that focuses on MLPs, you, you know them well, Wiley, um, you know, they, they don't think they're bro broken forever. I think that, uh, you know, they just were, like a lot of markets, the MLP market got overdone. Uh, not in shipping per se, but, but overall there were, there were yields of 2 and 3%, which imply you've done multiples of 15 to 16, 17 times. And, you know, for, for assets that, that didn't fundamentally uh, earn that kind of valuation. So, you know, what happened, always, what always happens when markets get overextended, they, they, they collapse. And you combine that with the energy collapse and you have a double whammy. So I, I think more normally priced MLPs will come back. And then broadly speaking, I think that dividend yield as, a, as one way of 
running a company to get a good valuation, a shipping company, it doesn't have to be an MOP, but the dividend yield strategy, you know, I don't, I, that's uh, been around for a long time. I don't think that's going away. I would add the comment. I, I agree with, with what has been said. I, I do think that long term the MLP market will be here. But I, I think there's one important element for shipping that's different from the energy sector and MLPs, which is MLPs in the energy sector as a structure give a company a cash flow advantage in terms of avoiding corporate taxes. In the shipping sector, uh, an MLP does not serve that same purpose. So you can be a regular way corporation, you can be an MLP, and it's the dividend policy and the nature of your cash flows that is attracting an investor into your stock. So my view is that the MLP sector will be here for shipping companies. It will likely be more limited to the companies that truly have cash flows that are contracted and stable over the long term through the cycles, as opposed to seeing companies that fundamentally have more cyclically oriented cash flows take advantage of the structure. But it is a corporate structure overlaid over a business strategy, and ultimately, it's that business strategy which determines your valuation. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned that uh, earlier that there's, there hasn't been a, uh, a real capital markets transaction, a new IPO in a, in a fair amount of time uh, for the market. How, will, how do you think the capital markets window, or really the, the lack of a capital markets window, for, especially for IPOs, will affect future private equity in shipping? I'm sorry, the question is how does the lack of an IPO market affect the do, do you think that, do, you th do, do you think the current capital market situation is going to affect private equity and shipping? Obviously, there's a fair number of companies that are in uh, yeah. private equity funds that have already invested and they may be done or they may not, but uh, how for, for the ones who potentially might be investing in shipping, how will the capital markets window uh, cloud their judgment or change their minds? Well, I, I think that a lot of private equity firms um, there, there is certainly still private equity money out there. I would say a lot of private equity firms have made their bet in shipping. And I think that um, the lack of an IPO market uh, is an inhibition, but I think you also have to realize that these investments are made with at least five to seven year time horizons. and I. I don't think anybody here is saying that over a five to seven year period we won't have a, an IPO market in shipping. The private equity investment in shipping is driving a lot of the M&A discussions that are going on, and I think that that's probably healthy for the sector overall. Um, I, it, it certainly doesn't help that a, uh, a source of capital that had contemplated perhaps the IPO market being there for them in the last year or year and a half. Um, it's not been there for them. But, I, I, you know, I don't, I don't think that a – so I don't think that the private equity investor of today is necessarily foc focusing on the IPO market of today. I think it's really the private equity investor who's come in over the last three to five years. For the companies that are already public, uh, can they? How are? They, do you think that they have access to capital in the public markets? How are? They, how are they able to conduct offerings or um, get money if necessary? I guess. Well, at the, I'll start at Go the ahead, present Rick. time. Uh, you know, the market is just very thin. I think you know we've had in the U.S. market leaving shipping aside for the moment, I think seven IPOs, maybe eight, seven of w all but one have been in the biotech area. So uh, access to capital isn't really great for anybody um, at this point in time. I guess the, I, I have an inclination, let's put it that way, that um, after first quarter earnings, you'll see companies, if we you know, really look across the shipping sector, as difficult as it's been, there has been some rally, and I think you can begin to see the fragments, you know, of a of a story among the shipping names where investors have some preference. And Krista touched on it that, you know, there are some, uh, you know, inv investors who'd like to get involved and see value, but it's some combination of the technicals of the stock and able to accumulate a position and so on. 
I think those kinds of companies, you, what you, you know, if you were to say who's performed better, it's generally where there has been yield, although there are plenty of examples where there's yield and those stocks haven't performed, but generally where there's yield, generally where that yield is thought to be sustainable. Um, generally that means a stronger balance sheet or at least, you know, no spy maturity spikes and so on. And so uh, my, my instinct tells me that uh, those kinds of companies will come, will be able to come back to the market. And I think it, for investors, having gone through this difficult period, it'll be useful for them, difficult period, not just the bear market, but also late last year with so much, such, such a sell-off and dividends being cut and so on, to see uh, 10Ks filed, first quarter results, to be able to see kind of a quarter of operating in this environment and see that the fundamentals might be better for some companies, tankers come to mind, than uh, you know, where the valuations are. And at that point, you, know, you could see some rally. But at the present time, you know, the markets are just very thin. And you know, deals that are done are sort of you know, already with anchor investors in them, and they're very small. And I would also add that it's, to get deals done today, there is a greater discount that is required in terms of incentivizing investors to come into what are already low valuations on a relative basis for most companies. Yeah, and I would say the other kind of source of capital, apart from doing like a regular way follow-on, uh, would be, you know, having a, a private investor come in and take a large piece of it, uh, whether that's a private equity firm or a hedge fund. But the reference price, again, is more or less going to be where the stock's trading today. So most issuers would, like Andrew says, I think kind of hope that the market looks like it's on a healing trajectory and think about things in the next, over the next kind of coming months. Well, I guess it wouldn't be a capital markets discussion if we didn't at least touch upon the, uh, the disparity between the tanker market and I guess every other market, really dry bulk and containers generally. Um, I guess the, the, first, the main question is can such a disparity last um, long term between the two markets? And, and the second kind of part of that question is, there are some people who believe that the tanker market is a, you know, a little bit of a boom, a mini boom for the shipping space. Is that, gonna, is that something that's going to be over soon? Is it going to have a, is that a forecast or is it that dry, dry bulk might kind of pull itself up by its bootstraps, as one might say? Well, let me, let me take it as an ex-tanker guy, let me take a, a first crack at that because I, I think about this all the time. I mean, we see this disparity between the tanker segments broadly and, and, uh, and particularly dry bulk and, and, and containers, but then even the other uh, gas sectors are you know, a little softer. So it feels sometimes like you know, th 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 there's like a vote being taken and if more people put their hands up for pessimism and a bad market, then, uh, then that, that's the winning vote and it can't be good in, in tankers, which makes me wonder if the tanker guys must feel like a, you know, undertakers during the plague or something like that. I mean, you're making a lot of money, but it just doesn't feel very good, right? I mean, it's just not, not fun. But, uh, but so, you know, what is it? Are they going to just, uh, just uh, you know, sink down into the black hole that's the rest of shipping or not? My answer is a theory that I think the problem is the S&P market for tankers is not functioning as well as it could. And I don't want to say should, but as well as we would like, right? So, so what's happening is that demonstrably tanker values are falling. So everyone says, aha, that proves it. it it's, a, it's a mini boom. Uh, in rates, forget about the rates, you know, they're, they're, the values are falling, it, it, the tankers are headed to where everyone else is. But the values are, are based on an SP market that's not working right because there aren't the same number of buyers and sellers. You know, there, there's just a lot more sellers for all kinds of reasons that's been discussed today and in other panels. We know that, you know, if you have assets in both dry and wet, you're, you're selling the good rather than selling the bad if you can. And, you know, it's just not the natural buyers for, for you know, for, for tankers. So it just isn't functioning as well as, as it should or could. So the values are falling, and therefore it sounds smart to say that the whole segment must be falling after it. So I'm going to go on, on the record as saying I think the tankers can stay functioning quite well for a while. Anyone else? Yeah, I think, no. I think a lot of us have, have uh, thought about some of these things that Jeff just said. Uh, I think you've got to throw in there, too, that, that the uh, financing market is particularly difficult, and so that that, that will have a real dampening effect on asset values. So I, I tend to be in Jeff's camp as well. Uh, looks like we just have 
two or three more minutes, so maybe one or two more questions. Uh, how do you see private companies accessing the capital markets uh, if they can? Uh, debt, equity, uh, U.S. versus Norway, any, any particular thoughts? If they can. Um, I'm happy to Go start. Ahead. I'd say that you know, we've had a lot of discussion up here, and I think we're all in agreement in terms of where the markets are today, and so things are, are quite difficult. I, I do believe that the capital markets will continue to be a growing part of shipping as a whole. I do think that as the capital markets have matured and, have, and ha as more companies have accessed the markets, the standard that it takes to get public is higher in terms of the quality of company and the size of company. Uh, and part of that is really because when you look at the number, the sheer number of listed companies, there are quite a few. So I do think that for a private company to access public capital, uh, one key consideration just from a pure metrics perspective is going to be the size and the scale of that company going forward. I think that really for any meaningful opening of the capital markets, for, particularly for private companies, uh, investors, have to feel like they have made money in existing stocks. And that, that, uh, that's going to take, I think, the consensus up here is that that's probably going to take a while. Um, in the meantime, uh, there's just no question that, uh, and particularly in some of the more troubled sectors, cash is really, really important. And it's just, you know, that, 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 that it's probably a time to be slowing down on, if you haven't already, slowing down on acquisitions and conserving cash. Yeah, I think just generally it'll take a while. I think uh, to Eric's point, the sequence is the equity markets firm up, uh, up enough to see the performing subsectors like the tankers actually get to, you know, choose your metric, NAV or better, um, provide investors with some returns that they've been lacking for a long time. So the longer we stay down, the longer I think the recovery takes on top of that for people to gain confidence in shipping again. And then to Krista's point, you know, the next IPO, I think, of a dry bulk company is not going to be 10 or 15 ships. It's going to be something that has to stack up against the folks who survive this downturn. So it's, it'll take a while, and I think the bar is going to be higher. Maybe just add one point following up on point Krista made, <clears throat> and uh, let me just uh, stipulate, I guess, that, you know, we're all, what's going to sound like a pitch for the securities markets is easy to have it come from the five of us, but um, I think the other big picture issue that's maybe lost in this bear market we're in now is the fact that uh, we're, if you're a private company or a public company, that and you've historically financed yourself with bank debt and equity, and particularly if you're a private company, and that's the kind of, that's this that's the question you've asked. Um, bank cat traditional ship finance bank debt is going to decrease as a percentage of the overall shipping industry balance sheet. Um, and any of us that are in the ship lending business know that uh, you know the regulators are you know, implementation of Basel III and the regulators are very focused on illiquid risk and so on and so forth. And many of you here, if you're a ship owner, you've, you know that thing, it's more difficult with your banks for the most part uh, than it was 10 years ago. And so that force at work over time, slow as it is, grinding as it is, suggests that there's a greater role for capital other than equity and bank debt in the, in the balance sheet. Um, and so I think Chris is right that, you know, the markets are more mature and more companies will access the securities markets over time. Bank debt will always be important. It's always useful. It's critical, and particularly for new builds and certain kinds of projects and so on. But um, there's a greater and greater role. And I think right now it's difficult to see that in the middle of a bear market. But I have a feeling and if we're, you know, having this panel in 10 years' time, um, that, you know, there'll be more public companies and more companies accessing the capital market, shipping and shipping companies accessing the capital markets in one way uh, or another than we have today. 
I see we're near the end. I don't know if this is the last comment, but I'll leave that for you, Steve. It, but, it but, will but, be. <laughs> but uh, it builds off what Andrew just said. Forget about 10 years. I think you're right about that. But it's now the fourth year running. I think I've been on this particular panel. And, and so just to set where we are, absolutely, I think anyone up here would agree that we're capital markets shipping worse place than last year. Okay? It's gotten worse. Right? But I think a lot of us would, would tell you that the worst time in the last year has, is behind us. It doesn't mean we couldn't sink down and we couldn't have yet another worse year next year, but I think the worst time in the last 12 months is not yesterday. It, it, was, it was not the week before. It's sometime a little bit in the rearview mirror at the moment. And so there's some room for optimism that we're here a year from now, Steve, maybe you'll be doing the panel again, that we'll be saying it's an up year, okay? Well, I think it's the perfect time to end on a somewhat positive note and uh, thank everybody uh, for their time. and. Keep it.